The Walmart FLW Tour visits South Carolina's Lake Murray this week. The third stop on the tour poses new challenges for the world's best anglers. Hank Parker joins us today to help preview the action on the water and learn the tactics of today's top pros competing in the most lucrative fishing series on the planet. It all starts right now on FLW Outdoors. Welcome to another edition of FLW Outdoors. I'm Carlton Wing with Taylor Carr and Hank Parker. We're joining you from Lake Murray in South Carolina. This is the third stop on the Walmart FLW Tour. And it's a different Lake Murray. You know, one year ago, we'd have been about 10 or 15 feet underwater in this spot. Hank, this lake has changed immeasurably. I tell you, they're pulling it down. They're doing some work on the dam. And by pulling this lake down with the pre-spawn that we're dealing with now, normally these fish would be spawning up here. So it's the first time the fish have ever experienced this, so they're going to be confused. You know the fishermen have got to be a little bit confused on where to find these spawning fish, so it's going to be a challenge. Well, let's talk a little bit about this confusion because at every stop on the FLW Tour, some anglers will have a home lake advantage, but even the guys who have fished here all their lives are going to find this a very different body of water. It may even be a disadvantage to, be, to have that home field advantage because it's going to be so dramatically different than what it's been, so you may be hung up on little areas that now are not going to be productive at all because they'll be dry. How would you attack this lake, Hank? How would you prepare for this tournament? The, you know, we got a real enlightening weigh-in with the BFL tournament just a couple of weeks ago, so I, I'm familiar with what happened there. And those fish were caught in the lower part of the lake, around the grass, around the islands, off the point staging. I would assume that those fish are just going to move up on those points. They don't have these flats to spawn on. They'll move up on those points and spawn in the grass. So I think the fish are going to be close to where they were caught. They're just going to be up much shallower in that same grass. We've got three anglers coming up a little bit later on in this program with Hank Parker, and we learned a little bit from all three. What can we expect? Well, I think we'll see what they do and see their approach, and they're aware of the BFL weigh-in as well. So I think that's playing on everybody's mind, and I think that'll be a factor in how they set their strategies, and we'll see that just coming up in a few minutes. Our anglers are Wesley Strader, Robert Pearson, and also John Saffington, and they each have three ideas different on how to attack this lake. And I think that's unique, and that's pretty much common with all of our stops so far. Each angler's got their own perspective and their own approach, so we'll get to see that coming up. Well, before we launch in, Hank, we've got to congratulate you. you have been announced as a new member of the Pro Bass Fishing Hall of Fame. Well deserved and congratulations. Well, I appreciate that and it is quite an honor. I'm, I'm humbled by that. So it's exciting for me and uh, I'm in there with some great company with our, our comrade uh, Larry Nixon and that's pretty exciting. Hank Parker will join three of our FLW pros a little bit later on in the program and coming up next on FLW Outdoors, a preview of a very different Lake Murray in South Carolina. Here's today's field and stream trivia. Whom is Lake Murray named after? Is it Ephraim Z. Murray, Bill Murray, Fred McMurray, or William S. Murray? The field and stream trivia answer, Lake Murray is named for William S. Murray. He was the chief engineer for construction of the dam that created Lake Murray in 1930. Welcome back to FLW Outdoors. We're joining you from Lake Murray in South Carolina, the site of the third stop on the Walmart FLW Tour. And Taylor, this waterway has changed dramatically down as much as 15 feet, and it's really changing the way the anglers are attacking this tournament. FLW anglers have to adjust every tournament. Look at what they've done so far this year. Lake Okeechobee, a huge natural lake in Florida. The Atchafalaya Basin, also big. A tidal water in Louisiana. This is a man-made reservoir. It's a whole different kind of fishery. Plus, it's down 15 feet. It all requires adjustments by the best anglers in the world. It's the FLW Tour's third trip to Lake Murray, but it might as well be the first. 
water levels on Murray are down about 15 feet. So even the pros who fished here for years have a new lake to learn. It's going to be a new body of water for everyone involved, even the locals. Um, nothing looks the same. There's no fish in places where they're normally at in the spring because it's all dry. Um, normally Lake Murray goes down about five or six foot, and like I say, it's down 15 foot. They're working on the dam. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fish caught and a lot of good sacks brought in every day. Sounds like a real good test for these anglers. Real good test because re actually there's not going to be a local advantage because the lake is so low. You know we're all fishing new water too. How Murray fishes also depends a lot on the spawn. Water temperatures are in the 50s and a full moon is only a few days away, and that could bode well for sight anglers. Yeah, I think it's going to be wide open. I think you know it's it's going to be such a new lake that you know anybody's going to have a chance. And uh, the, you know, I, the thing I see though, I, I see it being a, another big bedding tournament. So. Uh, you know, I think the really good bed fishermen are going to be out there and, you know, really catching those bedding fish. Evan Rood pro Davey Hyde is one of the biggest Lake Murray fans you'll find. He grew up near the North Shore. But it's a great lake. It has a lot to offer. Uh, you know, you have vegetation on the lower end of this lake, the primary cover for the bass, and the upper end is a lot of, a lot of wood, and, and the water clarity is, is a lot more stained up there. So there's just a lot of variety here. It has a lot to offer. We've been here at FLW two years ago or three years ago, and it was some record catches. And it'll be that way again this year. You know, the spring of the year on Lake Murray, it, it rates right up there with the best of, you know, best of the fisheries throughout the country. More with Davy Height on his favorite lake later in the show. At about 20 miles long and 8 miles at its widest, Murray's 55,000 acres is tiny compared to Okeechobee and the Atchafalaya Basin. And with the lake down about 15 feet, and the fish more concentrated, the tournament figures to have a different tone than the season's first two events. It's uh, normally like 55,000 acres, and now it's like fishing 38,000 acres, which that sounds like a lot, but when you put this quality fisherman on it, it really makes it a small place. The FLW's been to Lake Murray twice. In 1999, Mike Worm's 18 pounds on day four blew the field away. And in 2000, Clark Wenlet sight fished his way to a title on Murray. Here's a look at your banana boat outdoor conditions. It's hard to get any better weather-wise than day one. Sunny skies and highs in the 70s. However, thunderstorms will usher in rain, which will make an appearance for the rest of the tournament. Temperatures will drop down to the 50s on Saturday. The UV index will drop from Wednesday's 6 to Saturday's 4. Coming up next on FLW Outdoors, Hank Parker talks with last year's champion on Lake Washita, Fuji Pro, Wesley Strader. FLW Outdoors is brought to you by Walmart. Always low prices, always. Hi, and welcome back to FLW Outdoors. We're going to be fishing with three anglers a day here on Lake Murray in South Carolina. We're going to start with Wesley Strader. You're going to tell us everything we need to know, aren't you? Well, I'm going to tell you what I think we need to know. I mean, <laughs> probably might not be the right thing, but I'm going to tell you what I think. I found out if you hit it and you rip it out, you won't get a bite. But when it's down like this, you're going to have everybody piled together down here on these, in this grass. They could just pull up on one of these points and spawn on the point itself. They think this big green boat is the biggest female bass they have ever seen in their life. But if you can get down and just let, let it tick, flutter. just let it tick. Uh, up until about four or five years ago, I didn't know that shad come from the ocean. Where I come from, I, you know, I grew up at home in East Tennessee. We have Douglas Lake, Cherokee Lake, North Lake, and they all fall, you know, 50, 60 foot during the, during the fall and in the wintertime. And what that does is it, all your fish that are like back up in those flats, when they draw that water down, it congregates them all together. And it seems to me like at certain times, the fishing's a little bit easier when it, you know, you got all those fish stacked together and they're, you know, competing for, for bait and they're just a little bit easier to catch sometimes, so. When you fish, when you fish a body of water like we have here at Lake Murray and you know that everybody you've seen for the last three or four days is basically on the same pattern. Does that make you want to do something different? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, you want to go do something different, and I'm going to go do something different, a little bit different, but the thing is, there's been so many big fish being caught out of this grass. I don't think that a man, I think maybe a man can go up the river and catch 
keeper fish, keeper size fish, which you may look into a big one or two, but there is just so many healthy, big fish coming out of this grass down here right now. It'd be hard to, you know, beat somebody at the river, I think. Does uh, that BFL weigh in that all those fish that were caught down here on this end of the lake? I guess it's pretty common knowledge that uh, there were just tons and tons of fish, 30 couple pounds on it, and all those fish were caught pretty much on this end of the lake. Does that influence you any? Well, it lets you know that they're down here, but things is a little bit different than it was in the BFL. Things just sort of went south a little bit. I mean, uh, a lot of those guys that call them in the BFL, from what I understand, call them out on the, you know, the ledges and on the outside grass line on points, and those fish are leaving, like we were talking about earlier. They're coming, I feel like they're coming this way. I feel like the, the winning stringer's either gonna come from the back of the pocket, a uh, secondary point or, you know, somewhere close to the back of the spawning ground. You don't believe they're going to be on the main channel hump? You I, think I, you got the pattern figured out It's just now putting it all together? Well, I think I got the pattern figured out, but I don't know if I have it. I mean, I, I, think, I know where they're going. I think that those out there on the humps are not going to, it's not going to be that much of a factor. I mean, I've seen a lot of guys out there fishing, but, you know, you keep getting two or three more days of this and those fish are gonna they're gonna go they just it's that time the loon's coming full the 18th and those fish and you know they're programmed they know where they're going what they're gonna do so i feel like that they're coming here like the guys that fish the flw and just like myself when i was younger i might come into this pocket and make me one pass it and i may catch five keepers and in my mentality when i was younger i thought that i've caught all the fish and i leave but you take the guys in the FLW and you know the other tourists, when they pull in this pocket and they go around and they catch five fish, they don't pick up and leave. They go back there and they cover it again. You know, and it's taken me time to learn that as a, I've matured as an angler. And that's, that's the things you need to look at if you're a, a beginning angler and you think you've went through and caught all the fish in the area. That's not the case. They, if, you, if you go through an area and you're fishing a fast moving bait and you catch five or six keepers or five or six fish, odds is if you'll go back through with something slower, there is a whole lot more fish that are less aggressive that are laying there that can be caught on something a slower moving bait. Tell us about your win last year. You're about on your anniversary. You win last year at Washita. Did Were you on them in practice? Did you have it hammered down or were you kind well, of like you are here? Well, I sort of thought I wasn't on them. I mean, uh, it was really tough. Wasn't get, but like just like here, wasn't get but about four, maybe five by today. I made a decision on the after I made the first cut. I made a decision on the, the third day to totally go against what I was doing because I knew what I was doing was fading away. I dropped everything I was doing. I picked up a spinner bait and a jig, and I went to the river and started looking for dirty water. I had three keepers and uh, had lost one that I thought was really going to hurt me in the. I had 15 minutes left in the tournament to go, and I pulled back in this, just like one of these pockets, a spawning pocket, and I'm going down the bank, and I'm throwing my rattle trap and throw it out just like that, and right before I throw it out, I said, Lord, if you just show me a six pounder on the bed, I man, that'd be great. And about the time I made the cast, as soon as it hit the water, I looked to my right, and right there in the tree, lo and behold, it was a bass, and I pitched over to the bank, I had picked my flipping stick up, which I'd been using up the river, and I just hopped it bite real fast. And what I did is the, the wealthiest strike I ever had in my life. There she is. Oh, God, what a fish. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, what a fish. Oh, whoa. Oh, my God, you see size of this fish. Coming up next on FLW Outdoors, one of the best names in the business, Mike Worm. Welcome back to Walmart FLW Outdoors and Lake Murray, South Carolina, third stop on the FLW Tour. And there's more from Hank Parker coming later in the show. But first, Mike Worm, an angler who has fished well here and is also appropriately named. He's got the name and he's got the game. Only once in the last six years has Mike finished outside of the top 15 in the FLW season standings. And coming back to Lake Murray is coming back to his last championship. So let's revisit that thrilling moment for Mike Worm as told by the members of his family and find out a little bit more about that perfect name. 
Some names are so perfect for the fishing profession, a bit of skepticism is not uncommon. Without a doubt, I've been asked that question many, many times. It's, it's got to the point where I automatically now, whenever I say my name, I spell it immediately. Because <laughs> people just always wonder. And I've showed my driver's license many times of unbelievers that didn't know who I was, you know, and they didn't believe the name was right. It's a good, uh, it's a good icebreaker. It's a good conversation starter, and you know, people don't, they don't forget it. It's That's, a good thing to remember. So genetically, it just uh, your family lines. You were made to do what you were doing right now. I think I was. I think <laughs> I was. <laughs> In spite of the ideal family moniker, Worm spent the first part of his professional life as a medical technologist working in hospitals. But success in fishing tournaments prompted a big family decision. His uh, tournament earnings started uh, outweighing his uh, career earnings uh, for medical technology, and so we had to ultimately make the decision to go one way or the other because um, he was either fishing tournaments all the time or he was at the hospital and he was never home. So we decided uh, when it got close to that uh, income point where they were level that uh, we would go with the pro fishing and I and, uh, haven't regretted it at all. It's been wonderful. Mike's new career choice wasn't necessarily a complete departure from the medical field. The medical field, there's stress there, of course. In the medical technology field and laboratory field, uh, there's a constant stress to not only report results out, but you must report them correctly, and you must report them quickly. So you're on constant stress there. Well, I just kind of moved that stress around to a different direction, and then now it's a stress to produce fish in a, in a tournament situation to stay focused. The rest of the Worm family discovered the new job uncovered new fringe benefits. I have a lot of guy friends that are like, oh my gosh, your dad's a fisherman. <laughs> and they come over and they see the garage, and it's just, they walk into a Walmart or something. Crazy. Some families may not have had the courage to follow the path Mike and Laura Worm chose, but then the family would have missed out on a classic scene like the one played out across two time zones one frantic Saturday afternoon. Well, I was home by myself, and um, Dad was away at this tournament, and a friend of ours, Sammy Lee, he used to work for Ranger, he called us. He goes, your dad's on TV. He's going to win this tournament. And so I call mom on the cell phone. I'm like, Mom, Dad, Dad's almost going to win this tournament. And she's like, yeah, Sammy already called me. And you need to get to Walmart so we can watch it. And I was like, well, how am I going to do that? I can't drive. We were on the freeway coming back this way. And we had to pass two Walmarts to get to this one. But we had to get Laura and get her with us. I was determined that all three of us were going to be together to see that. And uh, it was uh, really special for us to get to see it. We walk into the electronics department and he had just like weighed in and he was holding up these two big fish and it said Mike Worm winner. Mom starts bawling in the <laughs> middle of Walmart. My sister is running around the store going, oh my god, dad won! <laughs> I'm sitting there going. <laughs> had Mike stayed in medicine, no doubt he would have enjoyed a successful career. But the Worm family would have never experienced that thrill in Walmart four years ago. And the FLW Tour would have never met an angler so appropriately named. The medical profession's loss is professional fishing's gain. Mike finished sixth in last year's season standings. Currently, he's in 44th position, but look for him to move up here at Lake Murray. Coming up next on FLW Outdoors, Hank Parker goes on the water with 7-Up Pro, Rob Pearson. FLW Outdoors is brought to you by 7-Up. Make 7-Up yours by Pedigree. Healthy, happy dog for life. Hey, welcome back to FLW Outdoors. We're talking to Robert Pearson. Now, Robert, you're going to show us a little different twist here. We've been out fishing points and grass, and that's all I've heard. I hadn't heard anything about uh, shallow water or fishing around any docks or anything, so uh, not many docks left, so I guess no. you found a unique area. Absolutely. I mean, ab absolutely. This area that we're fishing now is uh, fairly shallow, and I'm expecting the fish to move from our points back into the creek here, up into these docks, because uh, with this wacky worm, we can get him to work. It is a wacky looking worm, man. We can get it to work. Uh, okay. Sure as hell that's going. I'm absolutely. Real, I'm real interested in seeing it. Okay. Let's go get him. That fish should be right here, Hank, okay? You know, we're going to go do our best, and when we uh, all put it on the line, up on the scales, 
That's what it is is what it is. That's right. You can't make it more than what it is. It's gonna take, I say, 37 pounds, 40 pounds. You like we all make the cut. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's strong. That's real strong. That's strong. Uh -huh. Have you seen any fish when you're riding around the after you got one cruising? No. No. We haven't seen cruising fish since we've been down here, huh? Come on, Hike. I'll get my drag cotton there. Come on, Hike. I told you I was wanting to catch me a pike. That's a pretty thing. That's a pretty thing, Hike. Now, if you was in the tournament, you'd be a little upset right now, wouldn't you? How about that? They tell me, Robert, that when you catch these, they're uh -huh. called chain pickerel. We call them jackfish. Most people down this way call them jacks. Yeah. Well, they're pretty, but they tell me that that's a sign of a healthy lake. That's a sign of a healthy lake. Yeah, right. when you get chain pickerel, you got, I know Santee Cooper used to be full of them. Uh -huh. And wherever we caught the, the jackfish, that's where we caught the bass. Right. things that I've already learned, but he just reiterated it and said, you know, have you thought about this? And have you thought about that? No. How you fishing going? Well, how These fish are definitely going to change, and I think they're changing. I think you're aware of that, so uh, it's anybody's game, and it may as well be yours. Might as well be mine, sir. So, like I said, I really appreciate it, and thanks a lot, and uh, I'm going to do my best. I guarantee you that. That's all you can ask for. Coming up on FLW Outdoors, one of the local favorites, South Carolina's Davy Height. Welcome back to FLW Outdoors. Hank Parker rejoins us in just a few moments. He'll have FLW champion John Sappington. But first, let's talk about another champion. There are lots of outstanding anglers from South Carolina, but the best known is probably Davy Height from just down the road in Prosperity, South Carolina. He grew up on this lake, and he loves Lake Murray. He's also won about everything in the world of pro fishing. He's won the FLW Championship, the Bassmasters Classic. He's never won here, though, and that's one of the things he'd really like to do. A few months ago, we came to Lake Murray and spent some real quality time with Prosperity South Carolina's Davy Height. You've won almost everything in the in the sport. Does it make it hard now to allocate your time as to what you're going to do? Well, it's, you know, pros and cons, you know. I remember sitting at home hoping somebody would call me to do something like this or do a promotion or a seminar or something like that, and now, you know, just don't have enough hours in the day, but that's a good problem to have, you know. Watch what you wish for, because it might come true. I think that's probably the biggest key to my success is being able to adjust during the, during the tournament. 
Making those own water adjustments during the tournament when the pressure's on really kind of separates the, the people that have some success and the people that don't. What was the big change in your life when all that success happened in several years? Well, you know, just I had to sit back and kind of pinch myself and, and wonder, you know, I, I dreamed of all those things, but, you know, I also dreamed of being Joe Montana, too, but, it, you know, you didn't really think they'd be realistic dreams. You know, I just thank the good Lord that I've been blessed in so many ways, and, you know, I don't feel any different. I, you know, if I go out fishing for $1,000 first place or 250000 like I was able to win an FLW championship, uh, you know, I give it 110%, and probably the only thing that has changed is my time away from my family, or that's the only negative. Everything else has just been wonderful, my, my dream since I've been 12 years old. It is very flattering. I went to Japan for a tackle show, and uh, I felt like Garth Brooks. I got off the plane, and there were people there waiting on me, and, you know, I can ride around my hometown, and nobody cares uh, where I stop. So. The farther you get away from home, the more of a celebrity you are in this sport, it seems like. So. Is fishing still fun for you? It is fun, you know. Uh, being competitive like I am, uh, fishing tournaments is fun. Just going out and fishing may not be as fun for me as it was at one time, but, but you know, I'm just so competitive. I'm going out fishing against, you know, one other person or 250 people. It, it, it makes that adrenaline pump. It gives me chill bumps when, when the flag drops and it's time to go. So my competitive nature, it, it makes it really, really fun. Kevin Van Dam and I and Mike Sermon, the three of us, went to the Bahamas and, and fished a little bit. And, just the three of us, Kevin, Mike, and I, uh, catching sharks in the Bahamas. You know, he, he was real competitive, so it was fun. Yeah, we had a great time. You like where the sport is right now? In the last year and a half, uh, a lot of things have happened in this sport, and a lot of people uh, out of the industry has, has drawn close to it and, and seem to be backing fishermen and, and, and uh, the tournament trails. And that's positive, so I feel better now about the sport than I ever have. And, you know, I don't feel like I'm really old, I'm only 37, but gosh, it'd be nice to be 21 again and get into this sport because there's a lot of great things happening. What would you tell a 21-year-old who wants to get started as a pro fisherman? I'd probably say fish all you can and get a good education. Uh, you need a little marketing background, a little public speaking, uh, a lot of different things. Uh, it's not all about fishing, it's a lot to do with marketing. And, but you do have to fish. A lot of it is being able to catch fish because that's, that's when you get to be on TV when you catch fish. So, you know, there's, there's, it takes a diverse person to, to be able to really, really attract the sponsorships uh, like they need to. So fish all you can uh, and go to school when you need to, that's for sure. Television is what has really brought money into this sport, you know. It was only a few years ago we were fishing $50,000 first prize for most tournaments. That was big money. And, you know, the, the, pri the payouts have gone way up, and it's all because of television. During tournaments, I'll be like this, and, oh, excuse me, did you get that one? What's your favorite part of this whole, your Davy Heights life? What's your favorite thing? Probably my favorite thing is having a, a wonderful wife and two kids. Uh, next favorite thing is, is being able to, to come out here and do what I dream of doing. You know, you, I, you can take that for granted so easy, but to actually dream from the time you're 11, 12 years old of doing something, and actually be able to be fortunate enough to come out here and do it for a living. You know, there's people that, that have jobs they dread going to each and every day. And uh, I have to, you know, hit myself sometimes when I dread going to a seminar in another state or something. And I'm like, hey, you know, you couldn't have a better job than this in the world. Hyde has won lots of big tournaments, but he's never won a major championship on his home lake. Now, he says he'll fish this one just the same, but I think a win on Lake Murray would mean the world to Davey Hyde. Well, coming up next on FLW Outdoors, Hank Parker joins FLW Tour champion from 2002, John Sappington. This tournament will probably be, probably be won up shallow, but you're not sure that you can make the cut up shallow, meaning the fish are going to continue to move up, I assume. Right. But you're going to have to figure out a way to make that cut and then worry about catching the fish up shallow. Exactly. I know there's some big fish that are shallow right now, and I've seen them. I've, I've done a lot of my pre-fishing just by turning the trolling motor on and running and seeing fish. And, and then I can turn around and I can go back and I can try to catch those fish or come back the next morning or another part of the day and catch those fish. You've actually seen them cruising or have you seen them I've holding seen, on the cover or bedding? I've seen
practice for this pattern. You're in a way, you're committing yourself pretty much to. I committed myself to it yesterday. You know, when you I've... fished deep all morning and didn't catch any fish, moved up here and caught three, you said, I'm going to commit myself to this and I'm going to work it out. I commit myself to it. Have you fished any other sections? It seems like almost everybody's talking about fishing in this area. Nobody seems to be going north. Have you tried further up? Yeah, I've got some. Um, my best areas are, are I really don't like out of my best area. <laughs> There you go with that mom again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I certainly don't want to take you. Mm -hmm. Got a loose mouth from what I hear. Oh, you <laughs> tell everybody everything. What do you do in a situation when you have eight or nine pounds fishing this pattern the first day and it takes bottom cuts 18 pounds and you've got to catch 25 the next day to have a shot at the cut. You just keep doing what you're doing and ignore that or you just completely abandon and go after whatever you think it takes to catch big fish? Like I say, my main goal is to make the championship every year. I finished in, in the, uh, every year I fished the FLW, I finished in the top 50 in points. And, and you, you do that by consistency. You know, I, I'll, if I, if I know how I can catch fish, I'm going to keep doing that. I'm not going to abandon it and go try something different until I've got my fish. Now, if I have my fish and, you know, say I'm catching a limit that's, that weighs 10 pounds a day and it takes 18 pounds a day, I'm going to catch my 10 pounds and then I'm going to go. For you, you would rather finish 28 than the swing for the fence trying to get in the top 10 and, and fall and lose points for the race at Richmond. Exactly. You know, this is my career. I'm trying to put together a track record over, over a year's time. You know, I'm, I want to be able to say that John Sappington's a consistent fisherman. And, Up next on FLW Outdoors, John Sappington, Part 2. <laughs> Look at that bass. Boy, it was a heck of a win for you. I mean a heck of a win. You know, losing a big fish and adversity and being able to come back from that. A lot of people lose a big fish, you might as well shoot them in the head. They're done for the day. Their confidence is gone. And I know you had your little special bait, a little confidence bait. I mean, that was your little deal. Yeah. And you broke that thing in the championship tournament. What did that do to you? Oh, that was that was mentally destroyed me, really. Took a lot of pressure off of me. Oh. I just broke the bill off my bait. I had a little uh, teenage crankbait that that. I painted the night before, and I had six of them, and one of them had had a had a little different action than what the other baits did. And when I was talking to the camera boat, and I'm used to fishing out of a single console boat, and I just did a roll cast, and I hit the windshield and broke the bill off my bait. I'd had I caught four fish on it, 
tell you, when you go to a lake and you fish with these guys and you don't catch any fish, you pretty much know they're protecting what water they found and it's going to be fairly tough. I think this is going to be a tournament where there's going to be a lot of fish caught, but I think they're going to be caught out of confined areas. They've really pulled the water down, fish are changing, and nobody wanted to show us their secret spot. So I think we got an idea of the pattern. We'll just see how it unfolds. But everybody feels good about their little spot, but they're not going to take me and show me, and they're not going to, unfortunately, because of me, they're not going to let you see them. But I think there's going to be a lot of fish caught. It's going to be interesting how this tournament unfolds, and I do think when it's all said and done, the fish will primarily be caught shallow. Coming up on FLW Outdoors, Dan Moorhead and a tip on jig fishing. These are the two species of bass that we have here in Lake Havasu. Well, obviously the one with the small mouth and the large mouth. I get a lot of questions on, on how do you tell the, the difference between the two, and they are of the same, same family. Um, one is obviously the, the mouth size. The, the mouth is, is not as, 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 as big and as wide as the large mouth is. Two is the, the, the coloration. You can see how the largemouth is a lot more green in color, whereas the, they call them bronze backs. Uh, the smallmouth is more of a brownish tone, copper tone to it. And the species in itself are very different in a way. These are almost like forest strain bass in a way. They're very, very finicky uh, at times, but they're also one of the most aggressive fish that you, you can have in a lake. And uh, a largemouth, the, the northern strain are always real steady. You know, they're always, they always act the same. They're easy, easy to pattern. Once you find them, you usually find more of them. Uh, but as for power and for fight, the smallmouth has always been no no notorious for that. And for the simple fact is you can see their, their, their fin uh, uh, configuration, they're, they're a lot shorter and more compact. You, you have a lot more power here than you normally would with a largemouth. Physically, you, you, can, you can tell the difference right away by the, the, the way they look on, on what, what's a largemouth and what's a smallmouth. Welcome back to FLW Outdoors. We are now in the home stretch of our preview of the third stop on the FLW Tour. Let's take a look now at the remaining schedule for the 2003 season. After Lake Murray, we go to Beaver Lake in Arkansas for the Walmart Open, followed by Kentucky Lake in May. In June, the Forest Wood Open on Lake Wheeler in Alabama. And then finally, the Road to Richmond ends in September on the James River with the FLW Championship. Let's take a look now at some of the other events in the FLW Outdoors family in the Everstart Western Division on Lake Mead. Sean Menderman of Post Falls, Idaho won with a championship catch of 8 pounds, 3 ounces. He won nearly $50,000 in cash and prizes. In the Texas Tournament Trail on Lake Amstead, Craig Workman won with a championship catch of 25 pounds, 8 ounces. He gets $10,000 plus a fully rigged Ranger boat. The next event in the Texas Tournament Trail on April 5th at Sam Rayburn Reservoir. Two events in the BFL to update you on. First in the Choo Choo Division, Lee Bird of Moody, Tennessee won with 20 pounds and 3 ounces. And in the Music City Division, Scott Lefevers of Mount Juliet, Tennessee won with 12 pounds even. For more information on all of the events in the FLW Outdoors family of tournaments, be sure to log on to FLWOutdoors.com. Our viewers often want to get involved and ask our pros question. We call it Ask a Pro. And this week's question comes from Zach Lamb of Augusta, Georgia. And his question is, what is the best time and place to throw a jig, and what's the best color to tie on? Well, Zach, with your answer, here's Evan Rude Pro, Dan Moorhead. Well, Zach, that's an easy one for me. I believe that there is no bad time to throw a jig. That's what we're looking for right there. It'll work anytime, anywhere, any water clarity, any water temperature. Ooh. Oh, you got me soaking wet. Uh, as far as color, uh, I keep my life real simple. After a pack and fishing tackle in and out of motel rooms for about nine years, uh, I've tried to cull things down, and, and I live with a, a black and brown, uh, black and blue, and then some form of green pumpkin in clearer water situations, and that pretty well gets me through anything I need. This is the part of the show we all go out on a limb and try and pick one angler who might win this tournament. That's hard to do. It's 175 anglers. 
I'm going to go with Dan Moorhead now. You just heard from Dan. He has a, an advantage possibly for two reasons. Lake Murray is somewhat similar to Kentucky and Barkley Lake, which are his home lakes, and also Dan's fishing real well right now. So I say watch for Dan Moorhead. I'm going to go with Clark Wendland, and admittedly, I'm not stepping out with some <laughs> bold decision here. Clark's won here before, and if we get into any kind of a spawning situation, Clark could be on him if we can get the weather just a little bit warmer, and he's got the experience to get right back into the winter circle, so Clark's my pick. <laughs> well, I picked David Fritz, and I will admit I've got a little bit of a home field advantage myself. I came down here and fished at Lake Murray just a couple of weeks ago, and they were really on on a crankbait, and no one's better on a crankbait than Fritz, so if the crankbait holds up, then I think Fritz might be our man. Now for these three and the other 172 pros in this event, obtaining points is going to be very important because of the stage of the season. You're going to see some strategies change. When they started in Okeechobee and even the Oshafali Basin, uh, it was all about making that top 10. But, you know, the top 48 guys are going to get to go to Richmond and compete in the Jacobs Cup for 500 mm -hmm. grand. Now that's a big deal. So now the points are very important. And as we were talking to John Saffington, uh, if he's out of that top 10 after the first day, not going to make the cut, looks like he needs to really catch a great big string, he can't afford to take that gamble and swing for the fence. He's got to catch what fish he can to score enough points to be able to make the top 48 and make it to Richmond. So you're going to see strategies being set differently here in the middle of the season. And we'll see how that strategy plays out next week as we bring you the championship from Lake Murray. And of course, the following week, Larry Nixon will join us with our champion and two other finalists. Thanks for watching, everybody, this week on FLW Outdoors. Is it over? Here we go. Is it over? Now, for these three finalists, where should I be looking now? Is this our main camera now? Are you got 15 feet down, which has completely changed the, compl uh, the, <laughs> kind of the, the complexion of this lake. It is 15 feet down from its normal normal levels. We've been talking about Lake Murray. The set. <laughs> so now, Mike's our three shot. We're from Lake Murray, and then a week following, Larry. I said Larry Miller. <laughs>